Dear friends and colleagues, welcome to the Long Game podcast where effort, energy, and time matter. My guest today is um, a colleague and a friend who works out of a wonderful uh, campus in Hoboken, New Jersey, Tej Patel, who's the Vice President for Information Technology and Chief Information Officer. He has joined that university right around the same time in August of last year, right around the time when I've joined my current assignment in my current role. Tej, welcome to the podcast. Milos, uh, uh, thanks. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be part of this conversation. Thank you very much. Could you uh, briefly, for those, of, for those of us who will be watching and listening the podcast who don't know you, could you give us a little bit of an intro about your background, your experience, education, and kind of things you've done so far? Sure, sure, Milos. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot to be said about the professional work, right? But uh, uh, there, there's a lot that a lot of folks don't know about me. First of all, I'm a father, I'm a husband, and, and, and a friend before I'm a leader, right? So that's the most important thing about my leadership. Uh, as I, I grew up at University of Pennsylvania, I have spent approximately 17 years uh, uh, deploying various uh, technical solutions, both strategic and technical in the nature. And uh, uh, last August, when this opportunity came from Stevens to lead their IT organization, I jumped on the uh, decision and, and made this move during a very difficult uh, time. And since then, I've been the VP and CIO at Stevens Institute of Technology have done tremendous amount of work uh, in, in, in operations, uh, data centers, security. Uh, in fact, even tried coding a little bit too uh, for a couple of years, you know, I, I tell you, I don't know how this, some of my colleagues can spend days and hours uh, doing some, some interesting work, right? Just not for me. So about, uh, about eight years ago, I decided to make a shift uh, towards more of a leadership and management and, and even today, I, I, I tell a lot of my colleagues that it was so easy back, back in those days where I would walk into a data center, reboot a server, and the problem fix. And I wish in this role, I could do the same thing, right? Walk in, put a magic wand, and, and, and problem is resolved. But that's not what leadership is all about, right? And the technology landscape is constantly changing, Mark Miller, as you know and the transformation that we, we experienced over the last 12 months. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. And, and I have never seen that happen in a higher education and the pace. So uh, I, I will stop there and, and I would love to hear your thoughts as well. Uh, I, um, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And it's interesting how um, the, the more you get involved and immersed in leadership in many respects, the lonelier, lonelier it gets. Because uh, you have less people to point to and say, now what, right? Because at some point it's you, because everybody else is pointing to you and asking, now what? So, um, and I, I, I resonate with your experience. Um, some of my roles um, over the last couple of decades have also been very, very technical. And I enjoyed being, you know, in a server room and getting stuff done, right. whether it's programming or developing or security assessment or an audit. It's me and technology. Um, they were... Um, you know, little to no emotions and not many other challenges and not many other perspectives, not many, in some cases, egos. You just got to the point that it was very functional, ones and zeros, and it either works or it doesn't, right? right? And you knew that early on. So interesting, you said eight years ago, you started being more intentional about shifting into leadership. In the last eight months, roughly eight months that you've spent at Stevens, how have you seen the priorities change from your kind of entrance into your role to where you and your team is now? What would you summarize are your current major priorities for both yourself, your team, and perhaps even the entire university? I think it's a great question, Milos. Uh, uh, Stevens um, has tremendous amount of pride when we say technology at our core and excellence in all we do. And, and we are one of the top ranked university when it comes to STEM-based learning and offerings. Uh, with that in mind, uh, the, the highest, the major priorities, what I call them as, as, as my vision and pillars 
it was a slightly different approach I took when I joined this organization. Instead of having a hundred day uh, a marching orders or a plan, I took a complete different approach because I still haven't been on campus more than two times, by the way. So it all has been virtual this entire transition. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And in terms of priorities, so I laid out four major priorities uh, for, for Stevens, uh, for myself, or, and for the IT organization. First is, it's I call Protect Stevens. Uh, it's a cybersecurity uh, program that I launched uh, back in August when I joined Stevens. It is one of the highest priority for us to provide meaningful, secure uh, environment uh, to our workforce who's working from anywhere nowadays. Uh, the second one I call is One IT. We saw there was a lot of uh, uh, centralization and a combination of centralization and decentralization. Um, and it was very important to build out that one IT culture that works towards providing uh, a high quality services to our faculty, staff, students, alumni, our corporate partners. So that's the second uh, um, uh, uh, priority. A third one, it's sort of always been there in higher education, but sort of never got momentum until pandemic happened. And I call that teaching with technology, right? And there is tremendous amount of opportunities, uh, particularly to this pillar at Stevens, as we continue to build out some of the capabilities in the coming months and years. And the last one, I call it cloud smart. Not cloud first, not mobile first, cloud smart. How do we build IT culture uh, that is looking at modern technology solution to empower our workforce at Stevens, but more importantly, also provides meaningful technical solutions uh, to incoming students and prospective students as well. So these are the main four priorities we are, we are highly focused on uh, day in and out Milos, and obviously, uh, at the end of the day, customer centricity and high quality service, they are at the center of everything we do. It is very interesting how your vision and the four pillars on top of which you're building other capabilities could be so eloquently positioned at pretty much any university in, in the nation that wants to be modern, that wants to be relevant, that wants to be current with the times and most importantly, be prepared for what's yet to come. So I applaud you for all of those um, initiatives and I'm sure they're being received with at different paces. Some things are easier to digest by the community than others. And, and I have no doubt with the leadership team that I know you're building that you uh, folks will get there. Now in, in this process of obviously from UPenn to Stevens and all of your other experiences, but most importantly over the last year, Right. We there's nothing I you know, uh, one of my pet peeves is when somebody says the new normal, there's nothing normal about this. Right. People are human beings, whether you are an extrovert or introvert is a separate conversation, but we want to be around others. We want that body language, that smile, that handshake at some point, those those hallway conversations that we all miss. But I do believe that the last year has provided us quite a few learning opportunities. What are the ones that stand out for you? Like when you look at higher education as a whole, what are some of the things that you think we have uncovered and learned that hopefully we can build upon and not throw away six or 12 months from now, but actually embrace in how we do business today? I think that's a, that's a really, really uh, important question, uh, 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 Milos, Milos. And I think one of the best thing that, that I have noticed uh, uh, throughout those last eight months in digital everything is how do we approach problem solving, right? In this virtual world. But more importantly, what does it mean to collaborate, learn while making sure of well beings of our team members as well? There's a lot to be said about this hybrid workforce and, and there are a lot of reports have been published, right? I read somewhere recently that the meetings, uh, uh, weekly meetings number have increased by 148%, right? And, and I think that sort of allows us to pause as a leader 
and think about what are we doing to continue building our team culture that, that sort of continues to, uh, to provide innovative solution to our institutions, but more importantly, finds a way uh, to, to, to a balanced approach, right? While working from home or working from Starbucks or elsewhere, a lot of us have children, right? How are we going to make sure that we are mindful of some of those challenges that, that, uh, that our team members are, are sort of addressing while they are still delivering uh, top quality services and, and projects outcomes for our institutions? So there's a lot to learn hybrid work and workforce, uh, it's inevitable. It's going to stay with us, Milos, but I do feel that we're still learning and we don't have answer to all of this question associated with, with hybrid work remote uh, sort of uh, engagement. So uh, it's a continuous improvement in my opinion. I, 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 I agree with you and I think you're a, you're a bit modest. Um, in your delivery of, of some of the observations and, and opportunities as to how do we move forward. But I'm gonna to try to put you in a, a little bit of an uncomfortable seat for just a split second. And I know it's not easy for us um, tech folks in many cases, even though um, some of our colleagues do better at that than others. But if you were you know, tasked to being a futurist, if someone was to ask you, what is future of work and life? And that balance, like you said, one of the comments, as you were saying, I was writing down some notes and, and you know, that, that problem solving with empathy, right? That right. understanding, we still get to get stuff done, but people are first people before everything else. They're, you know, families and, and spouses and kids and parents and neighbors and friends and so many other complexities and, and components to consider. But if I was to ask you, what is your best guess as to what is future of work and life, or maybe life and work in five, seven, 10 years? Where do you think all of this is going? I think it's, it's going to be a combination of hybrid middles. And, and as long as we invest in space and technology to bridge that physical and digital worlds that, that we're still learning to bring them together, while providing meaningful platform solutions, uh, right, that will empower our workforce to just achieve that, that it doesn't matter whether you are in a physical world or a digital world, right? So that's the, that's the most important thing I think we're going to have to uh, consider uh, very seriously. Combating uh, a digital exhaustion from the top level, that becomes the highest priority. And uh, um, I think rethinking our employee experience, uh, whether it's from onboarding to, to sort of like having to go through that, that entire journey needs to be rethink completely in terms of how we onboarded our employees, faculty, students prior to pandemic and, and how we are going to uh, address some of these challenges now. Like one of the things that I, I tell my team members all the time is I would love for us to bring the classroom to where our, our students are, not other way around. So they are able to continue to engage with their peers and our faculty members. It's a wonderful comment. You know, it's that whole notion of don't simply digitize the processes that have existed for decades, reimagine them, Absolutely. transform them and leverage the tools, capabilities, technologies of today that we did not have the fortune of having a decade or two ago. Leverage what we have, I agree. And, in order to and, and just to go back to on that, right, I think there is a, there's a big emphasis on, on DEI initiatives, right? So when we talk about this physical and digital world, I personally struggle, how are we going to provide DEI specific solutions to this, this hybrid workforce uh, while they are working from anywhere, right? And we're still trying to be mindful of that. Um, agreed, 100%. I've seen that when I was in Jersey and Jersey City, and, and, and um, I see it now here in Michigan. There are certain assumptions that many of us make, and they're not always correct. Right? You assume that someone has the network capability. You assume that someone has a device. You assume that they have a safe place at home that they can actually turn that camera on comfortably. And often, none of those things are true. Absolutely. I am 100% um, in agreement with you. Uh, when it comes to transforming, when it comes to change, when it comes to 
um, doing things differently. In my experience, two kind of areas that are, are intertwined um, really matter. And I'm going to ask you about what, first and then the second, or you can answer in whatever order you prefer. And they are culture and leadership. Right? As Peter Drucker used to say, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I've also worked with and for many people who are exceptional leaders. And I've also worked with those who were in leadership positions, but not necessarily leading. Could you share your experiences across um, your, your uh, vast career as to what impact does culture have on growth and change and transformation as well as what impact does leadership have? It's it's a, it's a, it's one of my favorite topic, Milos. You know, and uh, uh, oftentimes I refer. A lot of folks have asked me, "What is my leadership style?" Right, and and the answer is, uh, 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 it's all about people, right? It's all about bringing diverse uh, uh, team members together and empower them by providing a meaningful platform for them so that they can come together and, and provide innovative solution for any organization, right? They set the agenda, in my opinion, they meaning leaders, right? Leaders have a tremendous impact on, on company culture and it starts from top to bottom, right? And today's diverse work force, it's sort of reshaping what it means to achieve some of the personal and professional ambitions, right? And leadership will play or plays a, a, a great deal uh, um, into how one is shaping their professional career, right? So in my example, I've been always very fortunate to be mentored by some, some really, really amazing leaders. Uh, my current mentor is Tom Murphy, is the CIO and, and VP at University of Pennsylvania. And uh, it's been it's been tremendous uh, uh, opportunity to, to learn from someone like him, and I feel like we have a greater responsibility to create a safer environment for our team members so that they can come to work and and, and express their ideas, express their their emotions, right. And, and feeling uh, that they are safe, it's a safe zone for them. And that ultimately sort of leads towards uh, uh, what I call, again, in my, in my Stevens area is one IT, right? That's what we are trying to build. How can we come together to provide uh, a, a world-class customer service to, to our constituents? I think that's the, that's the bottom line from the leadership perspective. And it's our job to enable and empower our, 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 our culture, our team members just to do that. Well said. When it comes to growth, when it comes to progress, when it comes to advancement, um, the only thing certain is change, right? Um, at some point, someone went and bought a thousand horses right before Model T went into production. Long term, if the intent was to buy horses for people to commute to work, longer term, they lost, right? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to innovation, when it comes to fostering it, enabling it, encouraging it, supporting it, how do you go about it? What is innovation to you? What does it mean? How do we go about it? And why does it truly matter to each of our organizations? You, you, Milos, uh, you, you are asking some really, really good questions. And, and these are some of the areas that I, I dabble in, in, in day in and out, right? Most recently, I think someone told me innovation is dry without motivation and drive, right? So this goes, and, and you won't believe this, this happens to be a 12 or a 13 year old girl who was, uh, uh, on the Times Magazine, uh, and, and, and this is the sentence coming from a 12 year old, uh, a child uh, who has done so much innovative work. And I was so inspired by that. Uh, innovation is so important in, in every aspect of our life, right? Uh, innovation allows us to solve complex, challenging problems, right? It allows us to sort of 
effectively respond to unforeseen events, right, such as pandemic. Look at what happened over the last eight to 12 months from no vaccine to, to, to development of vaccine. And, and now all of us are going through uh, our first doses and some of us are, already have gotten our second doses, right? So it has a, a greater societal impact overall when we talk about innovation. And that's the way I look at innovation. Um, on the, on the other side, right, I have heard things around uh, smart cities, right? Uh, things around home of things or home things, right? It's becoming extremely popular. And, and I feel like uh, uh, digital transformation and innovation goes hand on hand to improve our day-to-day -day lifestyle. And, and that's, uh, that's a one or two uh, uh, comments I have around innovation. Uh, and Another thing is, is about innovation is it provides meaning to, to some of the areas of research, right? That, that we, we help a lot of our faculty members and researchers in higher education, but also in a corporate world, a lot of those folks depend on, on technology to provide innovative uh, um, uh, uh, responses to some of the challenges uh, uh, that we've been trying to solve together. So that 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 these are a couple of ways that I look at innovation in general, and and obviously uh, uh, it motivates me every time I look at a problem. Can we find a creative creative solution to this problem? Right. Let's just not try to solve it uh, the way we have been doing this. Right. Can we find a, a, a better, improved way of doing the same thing again? Right. So that's the way I look at it. It excites me. I get motivated and, and I try to share this vision with the team all the time. I, I don't know if I answered your question fully. You, you have. Could you restate the question that that 12 year old girl or the state, the comment that she made? Innovation is dry without motivation and drive. That is very interesting, very, very profound. Um, you know, we, we all see this, those of us who, <clears throat> and I know you do as well, those who have kids, you're always amazed what they observe and what they pick up on around ourselves and how important it is to be the proper role models and, 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 and enable and set their creativity and imagination free while providing them maybe some of the guardrails of what integrity is and what honor is and what respect is and what inclusiveness and support and, and uh, focused on that level of, we're all in this together, no matter where we are and what we do. And once we get that out of our system, once we get out of, hey, I need to do this because of my next step in my career, because of what I wanna do for myself, versus what you said earlier on is that innovation is really meant to serve people. Absolutely. To serve the public. Um, it's a whole different ball game and it's a whole different perspective. And you get this new wave of energy that, that you seem never to run out of at that point. Um, meaningful, more importantly, right? It gives you a sense of belonging. It gives you a sense of purpose, right? It drives you. Absolutely. Um, when it comes to your career, um, when it comes to your experience, as a, whether it's in higher education, or whether it's in technology or as a technology executive now, or as what I like to often refer to, and I'm trying to get um, some of my colleagues and some of my team members to also think that way in many respects is, if you're doing a job well, you're really a business executive or a business leader who happens to be in charge of technology. And it's a different mindset as opposed to always putting forward tech, 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 more tech, more tech, more tech, because it's often not always the only option. In many instances, not even the first option. Sometimes it's reducing some of the technologies and complexities um, that provide a better customer experience and outcome. So when you look at, and uh, wherever you take it, whichever way you want to go, whether you want to take it across your entire career, something that kept coming up, or in higher education, or in your current institution, or wherever you want to go, what are some ongoing challenges that you have experienced or that you keep experiencing, whether it's as an individual or as a leader of a particular functional area? 
what is something that you, you know, happens to you again, maybe today and you go, I thought we were done with this. You know, this happened a year ago and this happened three years ago. This happened seven years ago. This happened a decade ago and it still keeps happening. I'm interested in, from your personal individualized perspective, what stands out? It's the people, my Vilash. And, and oftentimes as a, as a, as a tech oriented uh, business executives, we, we often tend to forget that, that at the end of the day, it's all about people and processes, not so much about technology. And, and this again goes back to my earlier uh, mention of rebooting a server and fixing a problem, right? And I, I have to uh, 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 be very uh, uh, direct here and, and honest here at the same time that uh, I, I still haven't mastered that art quite yet, you know, because I'm a serial technologist at the end of the day, and that's what drives me. And, and having to adjust, right, your thinking, our role also changes around those, those, those time, right, where we are trying, our role becomes as a liaison between the folks who actually does invention in a, in a, in a world of technology, and then the folks that are willing to consume some of those invention, right? And our job is to really link those two together to empower the outcome, which is in our case is student success, right? Faculty success, right? Uh, how do we align technology and technology strategy to make them more successful? And, and that's becoming increasingly clear to me as I, as I take on more responsibility partner with uh, not just the IT folks, but also other business areas on campus and elsewhere. And, and that's what sort of I try to do a lot of time. I try to bring people together, right? To, to look at ex exactly what we are trying to solve, right? Build relationship and credibility. And then the technology uh, becomes a really, really simple and easy task. So that's something it's, it's it has remained constant since day one. Uh, and it's still constant. If I fail to explain why we are doing this, what we are doing, a lot of time it creates a lot more challenges when it comes to execution, right? So I have taken a complete different approach where a lot of time I spend tremendous amount of time upfront not to educate my business partners, but also make sure that they're part of the decision making. And then we work together to roll out uh, any technical solution that will empower the business. Absolutely. And that's the challenge and that's the solution in one answer. Yeah, the, the, uh, the, you know, as Simon Sinek talks about why, right? Get to the why, why are we doing why. this? How and what comes a little bit later, but why are we doing this? We're doing this for our students. We're doing this for our faculty. We're doing this for, whatever the objective may be at that moment, um, other aspects of that fall into place much easier. And another comment that you just made, you said it slightly differently, but I think I got the gist, is, is how essential it truly is to be able to be a good storyteller. Yes, that's it. To know how to move people, to know how to spark that fire that we all have within us. And, and sustain that flame. Because, you know, it's easy to go and say, give a speech for 20, 30 minutes, you motivate people, and then Tuesday happens. Something else happens. It works for a few hours, works for a day, and then they're back to whatever they were doing in the past. Is finding a way to tell that story and tie it to how relevant they are to this journey and how truly much their contributions matter. Yeah. And I um, think Miles, uh, uh, to, to take it even further is once that is done, you, you also as a business executive, you also have to align the technical solution with your overall institutional strategy as well. And oftentimes we, 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 we've been always super focused on cloud migration, virtualization and this and that, right? And, and in reality, uh, we, we, we oftentimes forget the overall impact of such technologies on the receiving end, right? And how it supports our overall strategy to remain competitive in this extremely challenging world where everyone trying to compete in the same space. I, I agree, I agree. I look at it slightly different from one perspective, um, alignment. Um, you align two separate things because they're separate. 
right? So I'm aligning this paper to this notebook. Mm -hmm. um, I think in today's world, technology is the very thread in the fabric of everything that we do. It's no longer separate, but I agree with the notion and premise that it has to be in the service of why, again, why are we here? It right. needs to be able to serve and empower them. Um, you have a vast career and you are uh, still a very, very young uh, a gentleman who has many, many years of, of quality work and productivity ahead of you. But I know that many who look at you um, see a leader. I know from some of the folks on your team, um, I also have a relationship to Stevens. I've gotten two of my degrees from there in the past. So I know that university very well and I, I admire it and respect what was done in the past. And I'm, you know, I'm a fan in watching what you are doing now and where you're gonna take it next. But what advice do you have for those who aspire to your role, to those who aspire to leadership? You know, you have a mentor now, and I'm sure you've had him in the past, but to those who are looking to you as a mentor and a leader, what advice do you have for them as they guide and shape their own futures and their own careers? I could write a book on this, Milos, because I have made so many mistakes, but I think one of the things that I, I, I would share is get comfortable being uncomfortable, right? Ambiguity is natural. And I think that's the most important thing. Second, take calculated risk, right? And, and, and when you fail, make sure you learn something from those failures. I have failed so many times, Milos, but every time I fail, I learn something new. So that's something I would share with someone who's aspiring to be uh, in my role and uh, also have an entrepreneur mind mindset, right? Have a growth mindset and continue to learn. And one of the, the favorite quote uh, from Gandhi, if I, may can if I can quote on here is, live as if you were to die tomorrow and learn as if you were to live forever, right? So that's something drives me on a daily basis. So I'll leave those few thoughts for those inspiring to be a CIO. That's a, such a powerful quote, um, such a powerful quote. I've, I've heard abbreviated version of it uh, um, twisted in a different way. And if you really think about it, um, does, it's not meant for people to be reckless and loose and kind of loose cannons. But one of the things that I've also heard is live every day as if it's your last, one day you're going to be right. right. And then when you start grounding your behavior in, in that way of, of thinking mentality, um, possibilities are endless. So um, I know we rushed through the podcast a bit by comparison in the past. I know we're both a bit pressed for time, but I'm very grateful that um, we made this work today. And I know I've asked you a, a number of questions and we went in, in many different directions. I think every single question, every single answer you provided could be a separate chapter in its own. Um, but I wanna end with, turning it to you. What question do you have for those who will watch or listen to this podcast? What question do you have for audience? What is it that you would like to learn? What is it that you would like to um, get some different perspectives on? I know it's a, a last moment. And I generally often send questions in advance to many or most of my guests, but that did not work with us today. So what are your thoughts? What really stands out from your perspective? I think given what we are experiencing, right, uh, there, there are so much emotions, digital transformation taking place, right, things are shifting uh, from being traditional higher ed to more of a digitally empowered higher ed, right. I think one of the questions I would ask the audience is what challenges is your institution facing with digital everything? Right, and what are the expectations uh, 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 from your executive leaders to, to sort of support ongoing uh, 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 innovation and, and learning and teaching uh, um, uh, enterprise, right? Things are different now. So, so we'd love to hear some thoughts, particularly around digital everything. And, and it's really interesting. A lot of your answers that you've provided in the past, 20 or 30 minutes um, provide a lot of guidance and answers um, on that path on that journey already. And, and it's I'm really still learning with us. I'm yeah, still and it's learning. and it's really and it's really and, and that's the one of the things I really like about you is that humble 
servant leadership approach and mentality saying, I know what I know and I know what I'm good at, but there's so much more out there that I know nothing about. So let's make sure that every day is a learning experience. Absolutely. And, and the fact is, no matter what we are doing, uh, uh, the, the reality of this is, it's, and that's sort of, I, I wake up every day and I think about it, Milos says, our, our team members are struggling because of this pandemic, right? And, and we must do everything and find ways to help them to be more successful, both professionally and personally. So that's the last thought uh, I have to share with you. I can't think of a better closing statement. Um, it, it's been an honor and a privilege, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to continue these conversations down the road. Uh, you have a fan in me, in your approach, and in the approach of, of university and where it's moving forward. I'm looking forward as an alumni to see where Stevens is gonna go next and where technology can be of that positive change and positive service to people, to the community. And because I agree with you, um, at the end of the day or at the beginning of it all, it's always people. It's always about people. Everything else, process, policies, technologies, tools, all of it matters, but not as much as people do. Absolutely. So, um, Tej, thank you very much for your time. Um, and thank you for joining me today. And I want to thank everyone who's watching and listening to this podcast in this episode. I will leave some contact information below to reach out to both me and Tej for additional questions and comments and to continue continue this ever learning experience and journey that we're all on, right? Journey is not a destination. It is or, or journey is not or, or your success and happiness is not really about the destination. It's about the journey That's itself. Right. Absolutely. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you for your time. I look forward to it. And until next time, until next episode, I really want to remind everyone again to the very premise of the podcast and idea and one of my own uh, ways of thinking and doing things in work and in life. And that is there are no shortcuts to greatness. If there's something you want and something you believe in, you have to put the effort, time and energy into it to get it. I wish you all a wonderful day. Until next episode. Thanks, Milish.